how do we stop Aaron Yeager's unstoppable founding Titan without using Titan powers? Honestly, we've already got the perfect weapon, Mappa's release schedule. Sorry, Aaron, but there's some things you just can't, Tatakai. We haven't seen a fandom this impatient to watch the world end since 2012. Oh well, if Mikasa and Ko aren't getting the job done anytime soon, looks like we'll have to take matters into our own hands. In this video, we explore whether it's possible for humanity alone to defeat the rumbling before it's too late. We're going to assume prep time starts after the rumbling begins, so no poisoning drinks or locking Aaron in a padded room. We'll have to stop him at his best, not his worst. Disclaimer. This content in this video contains heavy spoilers for both the anime and the manga thus far. You have been warned. The Founding Titan is an absolute unit of a creature. 235 meters tall and thriving, shimmying his way down planet Earth with his chonky posse of colossal titans. Disturbing the peace and committing war crimes faster than you can say Geneva Convention, hypocrite. Aaron was able to unlock these premium packaged titan perks by playing a quick game of, uh, catch with his half-brother Zeke Jaeger. The two touch and sparks fly, literally, as they sort of fuse together, which gives them access to a fun thing called the coordinate. This is essentially the founding titan's true purpose, a junction where the paths of all subjects of Ymir and titans cross. The coordinate is controlled by the consciousness of the aforementioned Ymir Fritz, the OG, the day one, the first founding titan. And she gained her titan powers from fusing with this mysterious thing called the source of all living matter, which is a centipede apparently, but hey, we don't judge, we only observe. The source of all living matter is exactly what it sounds like, a personification of life itself, which gives Ymir the ability to create and manipulate living matter of the Eldian race, her people, as if it was sand on a beach. This includes memory manipulation, body disfiguration, transformation, and of course, the ability to create titans from scratch, including resummoning all previous incarnations of the nine titan shifters. And because Amir is now partnered up with Eren, it means this thing is fused with him as well. <laughs> that was a lot of fusion. What this all basically means is that by fighting the founding titan, you're actually fighting three things, controlled by three people. You're fighting Amir and her zombie army of titan shifter alumni, Zeke and his beast Titan, which doesn't seem like much until you remember he's like a god of long-range destruction, essentially the anti-artillery unit with all his memories and experience to back him up. And of course, you have Eren, the core. Like all Titan shifters, his real body, or in this case his severed head, pilots the Titan from inside its nape. His massive island of a Titan head is hard enough to get into as it is, hundreds of feet up and protected by tons of bone but it's made even harder by the wall of colossal titans around him, emitting a searing amount of heat at all times. But the scariest wall is his mental one. Aaron, via the coordinate, has full control of all Eldians' thoughts. He can read their minds, wipe their memories, and speak to them telepathically. On top of all that, he has the power to easily turn any Eldian into a pure mindless titan, against their will anyways. This would normally make taking him down impossible, as it essentially removes every Eldian from the equation, which in this case is about 90% of the cast, which is problematic because people like Hanji, Armin, and the rest of the scouts are the only people who actually know how to take him down. But luckily for us, Eren doesn't play dirty. He's explicitly stated that he will not interfere with his friend's decisions to take him down, because he would never deprive them of their freedom. We later find out the real reason, but for now let's assume Eren doesn't actually want to die. So cheers to that, there's some hope. And more good news, it's a matter of time. Turns out the devastating speed of the rumbling isn't actually as fast as we first thought. Thanks to r slash attack on Titan, a little bit of math and geometry involving Paradis's wall circumference is all you need to figure out that there are approximately 697,434 colossal titans, which take up a total length of 6,974 kilometers. Seeing that the circumference of the Earth is 40,075 kilometers, this means that Aaron can't destroy the entirety of humanity while going in a straight line. He'd have to zigzag a little, which takes up time. On top of that, based on certain calculations by Hanji, it's possible to estimate that the rumbling's movement clocks out at a speed of about 50 kilometers an hour. So assuming we have access to vehicles that can move at more than 100 kilometers an hour, which we do, we should be able to stay ahead of Aaron and move around with time to spare. All this means is that we have a little bit of prep time ahead of the action. With all this in mind, here's what we need. Phones, ODM gear, three planes, more blimps, the Azamabito clan, a Marleyan, two highly experienced and talented pilots, access to a lab, Hanji Zoe, as many willing soldiers and scouts as humanly possible, and explosives. For this to work, 
we're going to assume that humanity somehow manages to forget all of their grievances and, just for the moment, work together as one. We're also going to assume that the combatants have some prior knowledge of what the Founding Titan is capable of. Alright, here's how it goes down. In the beginning of Season 4, we were introduced to the reality of Titan warfare in the wider world, particularly through a growing trend and a thorn in Marley's side. The fact that technology was slowly catching up to Titan might, and would soon surpass them in strength. So fittingly enough, we're going to use technology to take down Eren. Firstly, instead of waiting two days before going after the Founding Titan, our heroes would need to leave as soon as the rumbling starts. The second those walls come down, it's go time. Current commander of the scout regiment, Hanji, would need to find Kiyomi Azumabito and the rest of the clan. She would gather them and all their intellectuals, scientists, engineers, you name it, and get them to safety. This will prevent the Jaegerists from later being able to hold them hostage. The Azumabito are, as far as we know, the most technologically advanced nation in the world, and their resources will be crucial in winning this war. Then comes the issues of overseas coordination. Hanji would need to find a way to contact the nation of Marley and instruct them to save their ammunition. Explosives will work on Eren, and we'll get to that, but not just by hurling bombs mindlessly. Luckily, humanity's last stand took place at Marley, so the world's collective firepower was already gathered in one place. So now, Marley would need to use their fleet of war blimps, planes, and military personnel to transport those explosives away to an Azumabito research facility farther away from the rumbling's direct path. Marley will fall, but not in vain. To get this message across, Hanji would need to find Peak, Magath, or another Marleyan militant and, well, ask for their phone. We've seen Marleyans use telecommunications before, so it wouldn't be a stretch to assume the military brought one to Paradis. The gamble, as Urban would say, is whether any phones survive the aftermath of the previous battle, or if they have signal to reach Marley. If they didn't, then we'd switch to the riskier plan B. Take one of the limited seaplanes and fly to Marley personally to convey this message. The world record for fastest aviation speed in 1930, roughly Attack on Titan's real-world equivalent time period, is approximately 280 kilometers an hour. And we've already seen that planes hold just enough fuel to catch up to the rumbling without stopping. So the plane would definitely get to Marley before the rumbling, but can Marley pack all those weapons in that time too? Access to phones would make organization far easier, but it's still a race against the clock. Assuming it works, our heroes then split into two teams. Team Marley, containing at least one Marleyan soldier like Peak, Magath, or Reiner, and Anya Kapon, an excellent pilot who will make sure the message is delivered as fast as possible. Then Team Science. Hanji, the Azumabito squad, a few special items, and whoever else wants to tag along, I suppose, will take advantage of the chaos to steal a ship and gun it to the aforementioned Azumabito center. This facility would need to be equipped with a lab, a dock, and would need to have at least one more seaplane. Because of the head start, we can hope they were able to find a facility that is at most a day's travel away by boat. And while Team Marley coordinates the weapons, Team Science tackles the most important part of this plan, building the Aaron Killer. Even though technology in AOT's time period is generally limited to World War II era at best, weapons technology has, unsurprisingly, taken a leap forward. However, the citizens of Paradis have a very unique explosive edge. Yes, because of geniuses like Hanji and Irwin, but mainly because of the existence of a fictional fuel source that's not nearly talked about enough. A compound found only on Paradis, Iceburst Stones. It's a little strange how Isayama introduced this vibranium-esque super resource and then just never brought it up again. Found underground in volcanic craters, these stones, when exposed to higher than freezing temperatures, begin to sublime into a gas. Gas that can be used as energy. Whether it's a byproduct of Titan abilities or something else entirely, the origin of iceberg stones are unclear, but their worth is not. One of the rarest minerals in the world, they're the main reason the Azumabito took an interest in Paradis in the first place, and they're very likely the secret behind the insanely explosive power of Thunder Spears and ODM gear, which until now seem to break all the laws of physics. So Hanji and the rest of the Azumabito engineers and scientists have about two days to develop the blueprints of a hardened, powerful series of missiles. They would need to use their subconscious experience fusing ice burst stones with weaponry to create the ultimate, massive thunder spear. We know that the founding titan isn't invincible. In the manga, a huge roll of dynamite was able to sever his neck. These spears just need to match that strength, and the combined knowledge of some of the smartest people in the world should surely be able to do it. Once Team Marley arrives with the plane, soldiers, and explosive weapons, Team Science should be able to use their resources to reverse engineer the explosives, fit them with ice burst fuel sources, and boom, we have an artillery. Next, we need to use any materials available to create a heat-proof suit. Because where we're going, it's gonna be hot. All crafting will have to be finished by day three. On day four, the fight begins. 
All stages of this plan will be aerial. This is to avoid a response from Emir Fritz. We've seen in the manga that our titans were only summoned once everyone landed on Eren, so we're hoping ranged attacks from the sky won't set off her panic response. The main force will consist of two seaplanes, each loaded with these ice burst spears. All soldiers on these craft will need to be equipped with heatproof gear. Since these planes move fast, and by day four Eren would have completely wiped out Marley, it shouldn't take these planes more than six hours to catch up with him. The plan will be to fly these planes right over the colossal titans, but not high enough that Eric can see you. The stream should mask the planes from sight as they creep closer to the head. Doing this would take an insane amount of piloting skill. Too low and you crash into the rumbling, too high and you crash into Eren. All this in thick steam and skin scorching heat, which is why we need the best pilots there are. To get as close to the founding titan's nape as possible before the shooting starts. The problem now is Zeke. As we know, the Beast Titan has an NFL gold medal in decimating aircraft, and if he catches on too early, that's goodbye to our planes, which is why we need a distraction. At the same time that the planes go into the steam, a fleet of all the remaining Marleyan ships will be deployed above Eren, armed to the teeth and ready to throw all the explosives they haven't already used in one big Hail Mary. Humanity's last stand happens here. Unfortunately, this stand is just a red herring to draw out Zeke, keeping his attention off the real threat. This would likely mean that everyone on these airships will go down as well. But with the amount of explosives they're raining, it's sure to agitate Zeke. It might even draw out Ymir to call a few Warhammer Titans, but we don't know for sure. They might be too far away to trigger it, which is the hope. With the sacrificial move in play, the playing unit would get as close as possible to the head and then let loose. If even one of the spears hit, it should do the trick and Eren's head will fall. But it's not over yet. This is where things get dicey because the shiny, creepy, crawly source of all living matter is gonna shoot out and try to reconnect Eren's head. We don't have an armored titan to wrestle it back down, so we have a few precious seconds to reach the head before it does. It will be a mad dash, as any remaining soldiers in the planes use ODM gear to get to the head. And this is where the third plane would come in, filled with fresh scouts with one goal and one goal only, get to the head. This plane would essentially take the place of Falco's Jaw Titan and likely carry Mikasa, Levi, and a bunch of S-tier scouts to its goal. The flight reaches its peak as all parties race to the head, and if all works out, a single thunder spear through the teeth should give the scouts an opening to enter the founding titan's mouth, find Eren's head, and cut it off once and for all. And just like that, the rumbling ceases. That's a lot to consider. No one said this would be easy. But as long as there's even the tiniest chance, the human spirit usually prevails. The sad truth is that this scenario would likely never happen. Not because of the insane odds or the death-defying stunts, but the fact that the idea of cooperating at this level would just happen too late. Attack on Titan is a world built on division, of both physical and metaphorical walls of cement and hatred, dividing people to the point of extinction. And that is why Eren's founding Titan is as dangerous as it is, because he is the living embodiment of the world's hate. And if it weren't for the goodness of a few brave souls, that hatred would have spelt the end of the world as we knew it. But what do you think? Does this theory have one too many flaws? Is humanity doomed without titans to aid their battle? Check out this video next. Kaido Unleashed. What if Shanks didn't stop him?